Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. And it's an honor and a privilege for me to introduce uh, Father Tom Daly. I'm so thankful that he's coming here tonight. Um, part, as part of the Men's Commission, we had him down in Reading last, uh, about a month ago down in St. Ignatius, and we had over 2,000 men come. So it's, it was quite an honor. And when I asked Father Tom to uh, come up here, I asked him for his bio. And he said, uh, you want the long version or the short version? And I said, really? <laughs> he said, he didn't say anything. He just said, I'll send you the short version. And I said, by the way, just send me the long version. I just want to see. I'm glad he gave me the short version. So anyway, for everything that he has done and accomplished, it's quite an honor for him to be here with us tonight. And just by the way, he teaches homiletics to our seminarians down at St. Charles. So that's the other thing. But you can't blame him for my homilies. So just so you know, I didn't go to St. Charles. So I'm just going to read a couple things that he has done, uh, the short version. I know it's been in our bulletin if you read it. But I just want to give you a little bit uh, of who Father Tom is. He holds the John Cardinal Foley Chair of Homiletics and Social Communications at St. Charles Borromeo, Borromeo Seminary in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. He lectures regularly in the Sophia Institute for Teachers and directs an annual webinar for the church management here uh, Institute at Villanova University. He earned his doctoral degree in biblical theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome and is a member of the Academy of Catholic Theology. He has written, edited, or translated 10 books and authored more than 65 contrib contributions in a variety of scholarly and pastoral publications. His commentaries have appeared in news outlets and one digital me media nationwide. Among other awards, he has been selected four times for inclusion in the who's who among Catholic teachers. So we are really uh, blessed and honored to have him here tonight to give us a talk on profiting from our talks. Father Tom Daly, thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thanks to all of you for coming out. Still a little chilly. Uh, it's a little chillier up here than it is in Philadelphia, but we'll manage. Uh, but thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to join you for this Lenten reflection, but of course now we're already halfway through it, actually more than halfway through it. So my hope is to offer you a few thoughts that can help carry you through the rest of Lent and actually beyond. So we're going to talk about this idea of our faults. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask any of you. Right? And I'm not going to reveal any. Um, but it's part of life. And certainly a part of life that we focus on during this Lenten season. Now, many years ago, I forget exactly when, um, there was a well-known psychiatrist named M. Scott Peck who wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled. The book was a humongous success. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for I don't know how long, uh, but I did read somewhere it was the longest, it was the paperback that was on that list the longest ever. One reason for that success may be the very first page of the book. Actually, the very first sentence of the book, which is the best opening line I've ever read. It said, and I quote, life is difficult, period. Brilliant, great way to start. Actually, we know that already. We know that to be true. But for Peck, it wasn't just an opening observation. It's the foundation to his whole book. You see, his point, which he demonstrated in the book, is that we human beings tend to assume that life should be easier. 
certainly easier than it is. And so we naturally prefer to avoid hardships and would rather not have to deal with them. Okay. To take the road less traveled, then, is to learn through discipline and hard work to confront and solve everyday problems. It's not always appealing, but as Peck argues, it's the only path to happiness. That's what a psychiatrist would argue. That's how he gets paid. But he's right. I certainly don't want to dismiss what he's saying. But there's another way to look at it. Another way to look at this journey we call life, and that is as St. Francis de Sales does. For him, traveling a spiritual road to happiness is difficult not because of avoidance mechanisms, what Peck is talking about, but because of a very innate human desire. It's because we want to be perfect. You do want to be perfect. Francis de Sales recognizes this disposition as something all of us share. After all, you're here when you could be elsewhere because you desire to learn something about Christian perfection. You want to be holier. You think you can be. And you're going to try really hard to be that. But of course, putting that into practice is a whole different story. Welcome to life and to what Lent is about. So this evening, my plan is to offer you a way to take that less traveled road now, and hopefully one day reach your eternal destination. The map I'm going to offer you is drawn from a different book, a book called Live Today Well, which is nowhere near being a bestseller. Although, if you hurry, you could change that. <laughs> I only need about four million more of you. <laughs> That's my only commercial plug for the evening. But first, let me say a word about our sponsor, St. Francis de Sales. You may or may not be familiar with him. We like to call him the other Francis. You know compared to that famous one from Assisi. Actually, Francis de Sales was named for St. Francis of Assisi. Our Francis was the Bishop of Geneva in the 17th century. He is a doctor of the church. There are only, I forget the number now, 36, I think, in the history of the church. He also wrote a bestseller, a classic book called The Introduction to the Devout Life. It never made it to the New York Times bestseller list because there was no New York Times back then. But ever since it's been, it was published more than 400 years ago, that book has never been out of print. That's how popular it is. Someone once told me it's one of the top, tell, top 10 selling books of religious devotion of all time. I have no idea who measures that, but I'll believe it. But before his fame as a writer, Francis de Sales began his church career as a missionary, a missionary to a land that was about, nowadays, 20 minutes from home for him. It was a land called the Chablais, which is just the whole sort of southern portion of the Lake of Geneva that area in Switzerland. That area had been mired in the wars of religion, a period in history, as I like to say, 
when folks took religion seriously in the sense that they killed each other over it. I don't mean to suggest we go back to that. But it was a different time. And because of that, the area had become a Protestant stronghold where Calvinism ruled both religion and society. Again, back in the day, most people couldn't, couldn't or didn't read. And so they would simply follow whatever religious beliefs their political leaders held. Despite his father's objections for fear of his son's life, young Francis took on the challenge of reviving Catholicism there. It had been the, re the religion of the land. And in a short time, he converted the entire region. Now, how he pulled that off is a rather long and complicated tale that I won't get into, except to say that his method was notably different than missionaries who had preceded him. It also worked a lot better. That method included three essentials. First, he was not afraid to celebrate his faith publicly in religious rituals, like the things we do during Lent. Because, in his view, beauty has its own power, the power to attract. And so the first thing he did when he got there, actually, was to celebrate Christmas Midnight Mass, which had not been celebrated in decades. He would have to literally cross over this river to this teeny tiny little chapel uh, where he celebrated Midnight Mass. Um, I had the opportunity, when I was studying in Europe, to go there. And of course, we drove over the river on a bridge, which wasn't there 400 years ago. When I looked and saw what he had to cross every day, I would have left him to God. I don't know how he did it, but he did. Second, despite the times in which people who disagreed about faith saw each other as mortal enemies, which they did, Francis made it a point to dialogue with anyone and everyone because, in his view, despite our differences, love always trumps judgment. And lastly, while he was convinced that he was right about what he was saying, aren't we all? Francis proposed what the Catholic faith believes he didn't try to impose it on other people. Because to him, the truth has its own power to convince. And I'll give you one little story about him. There are so many that shows you what I mean. Um, so he was a missionary preacher, and he would go into town and give a talk, and people would listen to him, kind of like you're doing here. Um, and after a while, he got so good at it and drew so many people to his talks that there was one town that literally made it against the law for people to go listen to him talk. Thankfully, you didn't have to worry about that. So what did he do? He thought to himself, well, if they're not allowed to come see me and hear me, I'll take it to them. The printing press had recently been invented, and so he would jot down his thoughts, right, copy them, and then walk around town and post them on all the lamp posts or on people's door posts. And that was it. Until suddenly, people looked at what he wrote and, and thought, this makes sense. Let's go see what he has to say. And they totally ignored the law. For that little... Um, I guess we'd call it nowadays pamphleteering. Francis de Sales was named the patron saint of the press because he sort of invented that. All right, don't get me started. I could tell lots of stories. But tonight I'm supposed to talk about how to profit from our faults, which I'm going to do for you in a simple five-step plan. So five things, not only to keep it simple, but so though, if you're counting, 
you can tell when I'm near the end. <laughs> Always important. All right, step number one. Step number one challenges us to face the facts. As Dr. Peck bluntly stated, life is difficult. Francis de Sales says the same thing, but differently, in two memorable quotes. First, he writes, our imperfections are going to accompany us to the grave. We can't go anywhere without having our feet on the ground. True. It's very true. But that truth often frustrates us. Sometimes we sense ourselves stuck with our feet in the mud of our misdeeds. But then the saint further explains, we must never be astonished at finding ourselves imperfect because there's no cure for it, he says. Again, there's no cure for being imperfect. You are not and never will be perfect. Sorry. If perchance you do think you've been cured of your faults, there are folks out there who will happily deliver you from your delusion. Some would say, not me, some would say, that's why marriage was invented. <laughs> Yet every one of us suffers from this fundamental fault of being human. None of us is God, despite our best efforts. And even saints experience this existential fault, but they faced it squarely and humbly. Francis de Sales himself wrote to his holy friend, St. Jane de Chantal, and said, I don't know how I am made. I feel miserable but I don't trouble myself about it. And sometimes I'm even happy in thinking that on account of my faults, I'm a really good object for the mercy of God. So admitting our inability to be perfect is good. Lent points us in that direction, but despairing about it is not good. Of course, none of us likes to fail, but our typical response to that, which is either to give up or try harder, that doesn't change the fact that earthly perfection eludes us. So rather than getting frustrated by that, Francis de Sales repeatedly counsels calmness amid the calamities of life is the only way to put things right. He describes it this way. He says, when we discover that the lute, right, the old, old time guitar, harp kind of thing, when we discover that the lute is out of tune, it is not necessary to break its strings and throw it out. What we have to do is lend an attentive ear to discover which, the, which is the discordant string, and then tighten it or loosen it to get it in tune. Now that's a very different outlook from what our contemporary world thinks, where we champion the value of self-esteem and take easy comfort in the supposed truth that I'm okay and you're okay. We will not be handing out any participation trophies tonight. <laughs> because Lent, Lent reminds us that Christian discipleship entails a cross. Carrying that cross every day it takes work. That cross reminds us that our first step on the Christian road requires 
that we acknowledge our faults, our weaknesses, and confess that we are all sinners. It's what we do at the beginning of Mass every time. We are all in need of continual conversion to Christ. But don't think that the ability to change and convert our lives is surely a matter of willpower. If it were, we all would have by now. To accomplish that, we need not to force ourselves to be better Christians, but, again, as Francis de Sales says, to bring about real change, we need to show, in his words, more compassion for our heart than passion against it. You know the old experience, you probably had this experience of getting angry and then getting angry at being angry and then getting angry at being It's just a black hole. No, he says, have more compassion for your heart than passion against it. Why? Because this makes the potential for change much stronger. As he writes, when we are compassionate, that sinks far deeper and penetrates more effectively than fretful, angry, stormy repentance. By the way, there's, there's a good lesson there for parents, teachers, and even coaches. Young people aren't perfect either, and getting angry at them doesn't change that fact, as we know. All right, on to step two. Step two invites us to shift the balance of power. What do I mean? Well, we change our mind for the better when we learn to focus not on our own ineptitude, for which there's plenty of evidence, but focus instead on the eternal power of God. After all, no matter how prevalent our misdeeds are, Nothing that we do or fail to do changes who God is. We can't change God. We can't do anything, anything, to make God love us more. God is eternal. He doesn't change. Francis de Sales writes that the foundation of our trust should always be in him, not in us. All the more so because we change. God never does. He always remains good and merciful. Whether we are weak and imperfect, or whether we are strong and perfect. And that, my friends, is the difference between optimism and hope. Optimism is just an outlook, a rosy colored glasses kind of thing. Hope is a conviction. For when we are truly convinced of what we believe, then we can entrust ourselves to the power of God. That's what gives us the best chance to advance along the path to perfection, because God alone has the power to redeem us. One of Francis de Sales' uh, spiritual daughters a mother, Mary de Sales Chapuis, wrote it this way centuries later. 
She said, each time we offer Jesus a fault to be forgiven, we offer him the title of Savior. Isn't that why we confess our sins? Not as an annual obligation or as an exercise in self-humiliation. And if you, you think it's humiliating, you should sit in my seat. We say, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, because only God can. And he always does. And he always will. Through this sacrament that we have come to know. That brings us to step three, which is to start over again. Oh, I don't mean my talk. I mean us. <laughs> Starting over again and again and again is what we are to do. But again, Francis de Sales wants to change our mind about that idea. Taking the steps to overcome our faults and live a holy life is a continual task. That's why we do Lent every year. When we have learned to change our minds about being perfect, and when we entrust ourselves to the power of God, who alone is perfect, then we can renew our efforts year after year, despite failing again. Now, some folks would say that starting over, despite never seeming to arrive at your goal, is just being thick-headed. Now, wasn't it, who was it? Einstein, who defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But spiritual sanity comes from being faithful and hopeful, despite also being sinful. So our annual efforts at conversion are not a sign of desperation, but of persistence. After all, even Jesus fell three times. That's why Francis de Sales thought that perfection does not come from being perfect, but from trying to be. And he says we try our best when we learn to start over again with each new day. Because each time we start over, we do so from a new place. And with each day that begins, indeed, with each hour that passes, we are drawing closer to our final destination in heaven. So that's the first three steps. That's what is entailed in changing your minds. Embrace your imperfection. Trust in God more than yourself. And persist in trying to better yourself each day. But to profit fully from our faults, there are still two more steps, short ones. Steps that take us down a new road when we learn to change our everyday routine. Here's what he means. Step number four. This step initiates the change in our routine every morning when we prepare for the inevitable. I'm guessing that at the start of your day, you probably, without even thinking about it, already make a mental checklist of what lies ahead of you. People to see, places to go, things to do. We think about our day. Well, to profit from that habit, St. Francis de Sales says, we should ponder the day before us, not just practically, but spiritually. 
by looking at all that's going to happen in terms of God-given opportunities to live out our faith. You see, some of what we will face during the day is foreseeable. I know where I have to go and who I have to meet and what I have to do. Other things are going to come as a total surprise. But in either case, there will be moments every day that challenge us with the temptation to let our own faults run free. In my line of work, they're called meetings. I often say to my students, I'm so glad that when God decided to save the world, he didn't send a committee. (laughs) In fact, there was a post on Facebook that says it even better. And I quote, most meetings should be emails. And most emails should be beers. (laughs) Thoroughly agree. But anyway, whatever the potentially troublesome moments are for you. Take a minute to choose ahead of time how to make the most of it by looking for ways to practice the virtue that's the opposite of your fault. So for example, if someone you have to see irritates or annoys you, Plan ahead to greet them nicely. At the very least, it will confuse them. (laughs) If somewhere you have to be will be uncomfortable or unwelcome, plan ahead of time how best to be peaceable. If something you have to do is difficult or even totally out of your control, Plan ahead and get ready to be more patient. There's a genius to this practice. It's a practice that Francis de Sales called the preparation of the day. And the genius is that if we confront the challenge before it occurs, if we ready ourselves to act virtuously, despite what are usually near occasions of sin, then we're much more likely to do the good that we would like to do. And then when your view of the day is complete, and it doesn't take all that long, he suggests we turn this daily planning into a prayer, simply by offering it all to God and asking for the grace to live today well. And then, of course, go to it. One day. That's all all he's talking about. Again, part, I think, of his genius. Because usually, and we think about it, for instance, in Lent, it's a six-week season. We think about making our lives holier, We think about all that we have to do, and it becomes a really big picture. To be holy your whole life, that's a really long time. To have to give up something for six whole weeks, except St. Patty's Day, (laughs) it's a challenge. Francis de Sales says, no, just one day. Think about that. If you can be a saint, if you can be holy for just one day. Okay, I got a shot at that. It's going to take some effort. But I can manage that. It's just today. And then, when tomorrow comes, start over. 
And you find that over the course of time, all of those days add up. Rather than looking at the whole of life, prepare just one day. Which, by the way, is the only day we have. Tomorrow's not here yet. And you can't change yesterday. So just worry about today. All right. Then at the end of each day comes the fifth and final step, which is to examine your conscience. How was your day is not just a question asked by spouses or friends. If we want to make progress in holiness, if we want to make progress down that less traveled road, then we should ask ourselves that question every night. But again, Francis de Sales insists that we answer that question of how was your day by reviewing the day from a spiritual perspective. And so mirroring what we did in the morning. How did your plan to be virtuous work out? How's today going for you? Did you lose it? Or have you done what you prepared to do? And where did those faults that are always with you come back to haunt you? To do this fruitfully, of course, we have to be honest with ourselves. But here's the difference, the Salesian difference. Whatever it is you find in that examination of conscience, whether it's good things or bad things, you should give thanks for all of it. Yes, for both the virtues you practiced and the vices by which you failed, give thanks. Because both of them are reasons for gratitude. The virtues as an expression of grace and inspiration. And the vices and faults as something you survived. And now you know you still need to work on. This idea of reviewing our day and how it went spiritually giving thanks for both the good things we accomplished and the things we didn't do so good. That giving thanks for our day is an insight from 400 plus years ago that today, in our time, has been proven to be true, scientifically. There's a field of study called positive psychology, which you can figure out what it's all about from the name. But they've done the studies that suggest, actually demonstrate, that if every single day you are thankful for three things, three very specific concrete things, not just thanks for a nice day, but I'm thankful that Father didn't yell at us. I don't know, right? Three things to be thankful for today. Three specific things. And they are, each day they become three different things. If you do that every day for three weeks, it changes your brain. Literally. They have the MRIs to prove it. It changes us, this idea of gratitude, whether for things that were great and marvelous and fun and wonderful, or anything. To be thankful, specifically, repeatedly, changes us. Why is that? 
Because it, you will find, if you try this, that if you have to figure out each day three things to be thankful for, you start looking for them. And when I'm looking to be thankful, it's guaranteed to be a more positive day. Francis de Sales knew that without MRIs. With that thanksgiving in mind, then we also can turn this nightly review into another prayer. So before you doze off tonight and each night, commend yourself to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I deliver up my spirit. After all, that's the bottom line. For God's love and mercy are still and always will be there for you. That's it. Five steps. It's a rather simple plan. Except it took me 40 minutes to explain it. The simple plan is this. First, Change your minds. To see that the need for conversion is not a self-criticism, but evidence that we aspire to heaven. And when heaven is the goal of your life's journey, your faults can profit you by showing where and how you need God's grace. And then cooperating with that grace, change your everyday routine to prepare for and examine your progress in holiness each day. It does take personal resolve to do this and keep starting over each day. But if we approach the spiritual journey of life just one day at a time, it becomes doable. In his Pedagogy of Devotion, Francis de Sales often repeats this maxim. Let us be firmly resolved to serve God with our whole heart and our whole life. Beyond that, let's not have any care about tomorrow. Let's think only of living today well. And when tomorrow comes, it also will be today. And then we can think about it. Finally, let me conclude with this caveat. The Salesian plan may be a simple strategy and one that works, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Dr. Peck was right. Life is difficult. Francis de Sales was right-er. He gives us a way to profit from our faults while reminding us that rest, in his words, rest is reserved for heaven. While on earth, we should always fight as though we are between fear and hope. But we must do so knowing that hope will always be the stronger and bearing in mind the power of the one who comes to our aid. Soon, that one will come to our aid again in the power of the Paschal Mystery. Until then, as you continue to journey through this Lenten season, may God come to you with his many graces, so that you will be the Christian disciples that God calls you to be. May God be blessed. Thank you. Do you have any uh, questions that you might want to ask Father about anything that you just spoke about?
or anything else? Because I know he has the answers for it, so. <laughs> anything? Anything pop up? Yes? The book? It's called Live Today Well. There are flyers in the back of the church. Thanks. Yeah, in the vestibule. So you just look, I think it's Sophia Institute. Sophia Institute, you can pick it up there. Okay. Anything else? Anything we want to reflect on or commend them on? Or I know there's a lot of a lot of meat there to think about, and uh, I know for me personally, it, the five-step program is pretty good. Something to look at, to reflect on, especially during this time of Lent. So, anyone? Anything? Well, I want to thank Father Tom for coming up from St. Charles and being with us. So. Let me give him a hand. Thank you.